Hi folks, I'm Ed Amorosa from Tag Cyber, and I'm here with some friends of mine. We're going to be doing the second in our roundtable series on cyber risk management. So we've got some really, really good experts here. We'll start with Howard Israel, who's a longtime cybersecurity luminary, worked in many different industries, including the intelligence community and telecom and financial services. Welcome, Howard. Thank you. And my friend, uh, Alon Kaplan, who's the CEO and founder of Strategic, which makes a risk management platform, and we'll learn a lot about some of the practical issues that you deal with. Thank you. And uh, Elena Kvachko, who is the uh, CIO for the security division at Barclays. I get that right? That's good. Done. Oh, sounds like a very good job. Sounds like <laughs> it would be fun. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, spend some time talking about practical cybersecurity risk management. Want to at some point get into some issues related to threat intelligence and threat feeds because I'm sure a lot of you watching are grappling with the problem of how we do cybersecurity risk management in the presence of data just about everywhere in SIMS and GRCs and you name it in, in log management tools and also in uh, um, Excel spreadsheets that managers use. So, Elena, I'm going to start with you. I know you think a lot about this topic, about cyber risk. Help us with some insights here. Get it, get us rolling. I know you have some really good uh, insights. I've heard you speak quite a bit about this. What 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 are the key issues in sort of cybersecurity risk management in business? Sure. Well, thank you so much, Ed. Obviously, digitization has brought a lot of new opportunities for companies to solve for complex problems, and also what it has done, it has shifted all of us, cybersecurity professionals, IT operators, and technologists from more traditional back office roles into more front lines of the companies as data and feeds become strategic assets for companies to reduce risks and solve for uh, fraud challenges and also basically resolve many more complex um, uh, problems. So if you look at the, the, the feeds that in the cyber risk modeling that you were um, asking us about, how would you think about building such a model? And I think broadly you could think about several types of uh, risks that could go into such model. First, there could be data feeds that would describe the actions of stakeholders. So that would be, you know, all the data that would come from profiling tools and how risky, um, and, you know, for instance, the insider threat can be or how risky different uh, behavioral um, actions could be. And they could be picked up by uh, anomaly detection tools, by fraud detection tools, and the way you would control potentially for such risks is through uh, controls for access, constant monitoring, and data leak prevention tools. So that would broadly describe the actions of the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Then at the next level you can go into uh, potentially risks that can be uh, brought by products or technology failures. And here you could look at the data feeds that would describe test results of the products, penetration testing, performance testing, unit testing, vulnerability scans, and capacity and demand management for your applications. And the way you would mitigate those types of risks would be through security by design, backup and recovery plans. You can look at constant upgrades of hardware, ensure that there is a proper capacity and demand management, and you, you account for those types of risks. Then again, if you go in the next level, uh, you can look at the failed internal processes and everything that basically accompanies those uh, technological uh, opportunities. So you can look at process design KPIs, you can look at execution KPIs, validation controls on technology and business standards. And the way you would potentially mitigate for those types of risks is through various performance improvement plans on, on your business operations. And then finally, you can also look at the risks that are associated with external events. So you can look at intelligence reports that you were mentioning in our conversations, industry published reports, threat assessments, news and trends. And you can, of course, mitigate for those types of risks for, uh, through resilient response plans and basically resiliency uh, and contingency plans. And obviously, no matter how you decide to structure your own risk management uh, organization and function, What's important, I think, is to maintain this holistic perspective that you have visibility across your products, across your business lines, across your stakeholders, and you're able to build this risk management on those connected and integrated data sets. I think that's such a, a clear uh, picture of risk management. Is that an artifact of being in financial services? Like, Probably. do you think financial services does a better job? Because that's a beautiful litany. I wish. I'm glad we got that recorded. That piece should be <laughs> required watching for anybody doing this. But do you think other industries maybe don't do it as well as that? 
Um, I think the, no matter where you fall in the maturity curve, th these types of principles would apply to all industries. Yeah. So I think it's um, pretty generic. You can customize that to your own business. And if you want to have a proper holistic view, um, this is probably how you could you could look at that. I'm sure there's different models as well. Maybe smaller companies would struggle more than bigger ones, I, I would think. Um, yes, but broadly, you know, like looking at the actions um, of your stakeholders, looking at the processes, looking at your technology performance, that should be um, an integral integral part of every business. Yeah, Alon, that's like a, a good description of how, how yeah. it's done, right? <laughs> Actually, I was I was really so absorbed in this description because the word that you use to describe everything is there is a need for a holistic perspective that is tapping into all sources of intelligence and when you're talking about external intelligence the question always arises what does it matter to me mm -hmm. because you can be bombarded with PDFs from now to eternity but to pick and choose out of it what is really important and to identify and to match a variety of sources this is where uh, we found trying to support the cyber risk officers that automation is critical. Mm -hmm. Because the question is, how can I absorb all of these sources into some actionable and forward-looking analytics? Mm -hmm. And in that respect, we need to see that we are talking several languages here. We are talking both human languages, because some of the pieces of information that are most exciting for American soil are written in in Chinese and Russian and Arabic and Farsi and other languages. And some of them are in technology languages. So we need to create a platform that unites everything to cater for only one question. What is actionable for this specific organization? So we can now focus on what they do with this information and to automate all the heavy lifting of just collecting and integrating it. You know, well, one of the factors that I think really plays here is threat. And Howard, you, you've been looking at this as long as anybody I know. What, what, give us a little summary of where you think threat has gone over the last couple to few decades. It probably started with something tough to characterize, and now it seems like you can't watch the news anymore without it's, significant threat. I, what I tell people, honestly, is where it is today is if you can imagine it, then it's probably doable, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Because I, o over my many, many years of working in, in information security, you know, every news item, any disclosure, any new artifact of a penetration or a breach, it, you know, you always used to raise your eyebrow and says, oh, wow, that's, that's amazing. Like, you know, and, and just that story has been played out in my mind hundreds of times. So my conclusion is, if you can just think about it and imagine something, it's probably doable, mm -hmm. you know. It's, Does that require maybe a, a threat manager or a, a cyber risk manager to be as tuned in externally as internally when you're doing risk for, for an organization? I think it does. I mean, everyone always says, look, what do you do to, to stay abreast of what's going on in the industry and what's, yeah. what's going on? With, and, you know, things can change very, very slowly for a while, but then things can move very, very quickly, very fast. So, you know, you got to be up and aware about what is going on outside of your world or your purview. So there's no doubt about that. I mean, that's, that's a piece of the job that everyone has to be aware of. Um, but as Elon says, what's most important is, so why is this important to me and why is this actionable? What is actionable about this? Because you can read this stuff from here to eternity and just basically say, well, that was really, really interesting, mm -hmm. but doesn't change what I'm going to do today or tomorrow, right? Yeah, or or exactly. change where I am right now. So the question is, how do I make this an actionable event? And that's the challenge. Actually, if we're co correlating both perspectives, and Elena, I think that you, you highlighted some of the top uh, reaction to some kinds of th profiles of threats. Mm -hmm. But in today's world, the relationship between a defense, a control, and an attack is not one-to-one. -one. We need to start talking about the aggregated stop power of all of our defenses. 
They could be the, the infrastructure defenses, quite a lot of those you described, the preventive and the detective controls. But this is an interplay mm -hmm. that when we're looking at a certain attack or attack pattern, we need to see what is the probability of success that emerges from this. And now I can start looking at the real action that resides within the intelligence. So typically we're always looking at the five or top five characteristics of any anything in the intelligence world. We're looking at attackers, uh, employing attack methods on assets to achieve a malicious intent, in a geography and in a business sector. So these are the, the, the critical five that we need to look at. Now, I need to find myself within that perimeter where my precious assets found themselves at the cross line of an attacker. Mm -hmm. And this is where it becomes actionable. All the rest could be uh, interesting stories to read uh, to your kids, but I'm not sure that we can do something about it. And last word, it must be quantified. It's no longer enough to say, well, there are bad people out there. OK, there are bad actors. And they are equipped with the right tools. But to what extent this is elevating to the point where I need to do something and change something, or maybe ensure it to a certain level? This is where quantification becomes a must. Now, Elena, in, in financial services, um, I would say the information sharing between banks is as good as it gets. I, I don't know of any other sector that does it. Do, do you see that as an important aspect of, um, of risk management, particularly as you try and figure out what the context would be mm -hmm. for some of the things that you were talking about? Like if there's a problem happening here and it's also happening in another bank, then immediately, just intuitively, you know the risk is higher. Like that's a trivial example. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing there must be more subtle ones where um, something in isolation or something in aggregate or some relationship. D d wouldn't say the FSI SAC or would um, the, that intimate relationship with, between banks mm -hmm. and financial uh, services groups, is that, does that happen? Is that aspirational or is that happening now? Well, it's absolutely happening now, and as mm. you pointed out, there's um, uh, different information um, um, security organizations that are already exchanging actionable information, including the one that we actually set up under um, Barclays Umbrella, which is Cyber Defense Alliance, uh, that brings together European organizations. And I also wanted to support um, the earlier points about um, how we can make sure that we are moving in the direction of the defensible cyberspace. And that exactly it was the focus of the report that uh, we right. worked uh, together on with right, you and right, other right. industry the partners. The New York State uh, Cyber Task Force. Exactly, mm -hmm. and Columbia University. I think that's a critical point. And another step in that direction would also be kind of for all of us to focus not only on point security solutions or controls, but on security by design, by basically mm -hmm. developing, producing, and manufacturing products that are secure by design, rather than constantly patching and uh, fixing for um, uh, security vulnerabilities that are found on a regular basis. Security by design, presumably, if, if you do that right, does that make the risk management commensurately easier? Like, as a it, when risk management's a, a tough mm -hmm. problem, that means you introduce risk, right? So I guess there's sort of a balance there between preventing things and then have to, having to deal with them on the back end. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, I think it does make it more, um, it does make it easier and it makes it more measurable. Mm -hmm. You would have to look at the risk at every stage of your uh, product development life cycle, you know, the stage of collecting requirements and uh, user acceptance and testing and rollout. You would have to think about risk and specific mitigation controls at every stage as opposed to thinking about it right before the product gets rolled Makes out. Sense. Howard, does government do this as well as uh, industry, or do you think they um, I, have a I don't to go? think they are anywhere near. <laughs> 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 I, honestly, um, you know, from my experience, uh, they always seem to be one to three steps behind. What about, I mean, in the intelligence know. community, you have some work experience there. That's, yeah. They must be pretty good. There. Well, things have changed since, since I've been there, so I can't really speak for what's going on today. Um, so it wouldn't really be kind of correct for me to comment too much on that because my experience is, is pretty much, uh, yeah. you know, 
archaic. Yeah. There's one of the things that I, I've always noticed is that the unit of risk at a place like NSA or the CIA or whatever is a little different than a bank, right? A bank is dealing with money, with, with finance, and, a, and a, an intelligence community dealing with national security. You would naturally think that they would be pretty darn good at this, but uh, I guess it's not there's clear. There's always challenges. There's people, processes, technology, and and our our methods and our technology and our people are, are not perfect. People make mistakes. Technology is not implemented necessarily uh, perfectly. Um, in fact, far from it. Um, and you know the processes aren't necessarily there. Yeah. So, and a lot of it is is what is the what is the commitment from the senior level about about security to drive those things. So, fair point. so and as we just saw from Equifax, right? So, you know, and, and you could do all those things just fine. You know, you could do all those things um, to, to the standards that your industry does or, or even better, best practice, and you could still have a failure because yeah. it's just, you can't guarantee perfection. Now, if I can speak up on that issue of looking forward, we are always struggling with the issue of prediction. And we kind of all lost our crystal balls. So we need to figure out how to use technology, how to use AI, how to use some intelligent statistical analytics in order to look a little bit into the future. And there are maybe two perspectives that come to mind to talk about forward-looking quantified analytics. One is, to look at trends and patterns that emerge from this quantified multi-source intelligence that enables us to create and validate those predictions to the extent that enables us to look a little bit and to simulate where we're heading. But another thing is we are not living in a physical world. We are living in a virtual world where it's easy to shift from one part of the globe to another. So today we can see explorations and tryouts of different attack patterns in different parts of the world that become relevant to the Western world at a later stage. So sharing information, not just about our neighborhood, what happened to another bank in New York City, but to be aware of different behaviors in different business sectors and different geographies, and to simulate what would it look like on my industry, on my specific bank in that example. This is where we're beginning to talk forward-looking, proactive risk management, rather than reactive. Part of it, by the way, is building the security into the systems, of course, but part of it is to simulate what-if scenarios on the fly, and to automate that to an extent okay. where I can see differences, this is where the tools of the risk officers. Let, let me ask you about that. So a, a typical company is going to have yeah. a SIM. Mm -hmm. They're going to have logs going somewhere, log management mm -hmm. systems, maybe the SIM. Sure. They're probably going to have a compliance tool. Mm -hmm. All the data flying all over the place. Yeah. When I'm doing risk management, do I need all of that? How do I? Combine it, I, I know you build a, a wonderful platform, sort of in general, what, mm -hmm. what's the strategy here? Do I just need to find a way to combine it? And these are all different feeds with different purposes and they come from different places. And yeah. High, medium, low on one might mean something different somewhere. Mm -hmm. How do you make sense of all that in a platform? The critical issue is to understand the need of the user. There is a huge difference between the need of the operator of the SIM, who is really looking at fluctuations in right. network and to see changes in the load balancer to uh, see the DDoS is coming yeah. his, his way. The risk officer needs to see the patterns that emerge. Step from above that? Step above. I guess. He needs to see the quantification of the trend. He needs to compare sources because the information that you get from the dark web and the information that you get from open sources mm -hmm. and from government sources. These are all different uh, illuminations of the same world that the risk officer is faced with. So looking at information coming from within, abnormal user behavior is an example. 
information about the perimeter, information about those uh, public and, and more covert indicators of compromise. This is where we are beginning to really get the intelligence part of the equation. But this is still only one arm, and you can't really clap with one arm. You need the other one. Mm -hmm. And the other one is as good quantification as, as the intelligence is, is the continuous monitoring of defenses. Now I can talk. Now I can create the action that I can bring to my board. Now I can create a meaningful discussion with my CFO, who is looking just for show me the money. And just is so. so this is where we can bring the discussion one notch above. All the operational level is there to stay. It's a must. But we can't keep on not having the bridge between decision makers, the story of the executive who was unable to recognize a CISO in the organization. They need to know each other. And we need a conduit. We need a vehicle. And this is where the extended capability of the cyber risk officer comes to play. This is where we That's a great it. point. You know, let's have a sort of a closing question for each of you. Uh, you mentioned cyber risk officer. I'll, I'll ask you, Elena, just sort of in terms of the um, just organizationally and position wise, what is your advice in terms of who should be doing the cyber risk management? Is it the security team maybe learning a little more about risk? Is it a risk team learning more about security? Mm -hmm. Is it a new position? What If you were um, able to wave a magic wand and you're <laughs> all figuring out who's doing this, well, how, how would you characterize the, uh, the correct place to do cyber risk yeah. uh, in a company? What do you think? I think uh, in terms of reporting lines, it might be organization specific. However, what you really need to ensure is that you have the buy-in from all the necessary stakeholders. And to do so, you need to make sure that not only security people or IT people know how technology works, but actually all of the employees know how, how it works. And in, in this case, it will be easier for you to achieve the risk management and risk mitigation goals that you're um, you set for your company. And I think broadly it's important for all of us in the industry to remember that we're only as secure as the rest of the internet. And so we're all in this together. Well, that would bode pretty poorly for most of us <laughs> at this point, right? It's good that we're all doing this work. Very, very reasonable uh, comments there. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Howard? So, I've, um, I, I, I'm a proponent of getting rid of the word security. I think it's outdated, outmoded. The connotations of it are not how we use it today mm -hmm. because people think of security, well, if I can find a flaw in it, it's not security. It's one little minor little thing that has really no impact on anything. So it's really thought of as a binary thing, secure, not secure. We need a new word like and the real word strate strategery. Risk, no. <laughs> risk management. Oh, risk risk management. Because it's right. a continuum. It's, I got, you know, I have to put some resource on it. How much, you know, well, what's it worth? You know, how much money do I have? How valuable is it? And it's risk management. Yeah. And we should do away with the term security. Mm -hmm. I do not like that term. I'm advocating blowing it up, okay? <laughs> so risk management is where it ought to be. And the, the old security team ought to be called the operational security team because mm -hmm. it's around operations. And tech. Or tech yeah. security, yeah. right? And because there's other types of risk. You know, in finance world, there's counterparty risk. You know, there, there's um, a transaction risk. Yeah. There's gazillions of types, and that should fall under the risk management organization. Yeah. You know, and, and I think the future is really, you know, CEOs and CFOs and every sports directors manage the company around P and L quite a lot. Um, the sales pipeline, you know, the funnel. Everyone talks about the funnel, right? Well, you know, risk is another way to manage the company is because now you're looking at, okay, so wh where are my problems and issues and what resources do I have available to mitigate those? Yeah. Another way to manage the enterprise or, or the organization is around risk. And I yeah. think that, that's a whole thing that's really blown up, I think, in the last three, four, five years. I've seen a lot of jobs out there now for risk management. Mm -hmm. And what they're talking is about, they want security people, Yeah, mm -hmm. you know? It's amazing so, how often yeah. we hear that bifurcation argument, you know, the techie versus the mm -hmm. business orientation yeah. that's common. What, what, yeah. what do you think of that? I think that, uh, as you said, banks uh, were ahead of the curve yeah. when they started defining the risk owner as the business manager. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think Basel II started the, the trend. 
and the entire definition of risk in general and cyber risk in particular starts from business perspective and then the extension of the business owner or the business leader is manifested manifested by the cyber risk officer of his responsibility so it is a business position supporting the business people in making the educated decisions working together with a variety of interfaces one of them is of course the technology part of the security but also HR the important role in awareness and selection of the right people all the regulations and compliance issues there are other offices like this in banks so this position is actually and I couldn't agree with you more with what was said here this is a cross-sectional position that people may merge to it from a CISA position but it is matching technology and business and finance and insurance on the same common ground. Really great points. Well, the three of you give me great hope that we have such smart people working in our industry. You guys are awesome to participate in our round table. Did you have fun? Yes. Yeah, it's it was great. a nice discussion. Really interesting stuff. So I really want to thank you, Elena, Howard, Milan. Thank, thank you. you very much. And we will see you next time. Thank you.